<laughs> oh dear. It's a, it's a game of musical chairs and Jack has lost the game. <laughs> Jack, we will, we will find you a seat. <laughs> In the meantime, Please. let me introduce you to the panellists. We can we get you one seated. from there. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> we have here Omar Amajdoué, the CEO of Ride Ventures, Hanadi Al Saleh from Agility, uh, Fadi Gandor, Executive Chairman at Wanda Capital, <laughs> Klaus Hommels, founder and chairman of Lakestar, also chair of the NATO Innovation Fund. And on the end, finally seated, we have <laughs> Jack Selby, managing director at Teal Capital and managing partner of AZBC. And actually, Jack, let's start with you now that you've managed to, to sit yourself down, because I think we should start with the lay of the land in terms of venture capital. And I find it really interesting that you've launched a new fund now after kind of crazy few years. I think one panelist said to me earlier that we've left the drunken years of, you know, frothy tech valuations. We've had a slowdown. Is now the time for a new fund? Well, let, let's talk about those drunken years. <laughs> uh, so there are two thought pieces that have come out in the last two weeks that I highly recommend if you haven't read. Uh, it's required reading. Uh, so Mark Andreessen wrote, wrote a piece essentially about uh, technology optimism. And so I think in this day and age when we talk about is AI good, bad, net, net for society, he addresses that topic very well. He also talks about concepts like universal, universal basic income, nuclear energy, so forth. So required reading, highly recommend it. Uh, but there's another memo that's come out uh, by Howard Marks. And essentially it's a requiem on this new interest rate environment that we live in. So after the great financial crisis for 13 years, we had a drunken time of free money. And so that created very interesting times in the technology market. And so I was doing some research that during that period, something like 1,200 global unicorns were created. It's a lot. I would boldly predict over the next two to three years, the vast majority of those, those unicorns will either price down, be subject to a shotgun marriage, or go out of business. So something big is going to happen. And behind the scenes, VCs are talking about this all the time back at least in Silicon Valley. So that's something that's coming. Um, how does that relate to this region as you can talk about creating diamonds? Um, I think, you know, probably in this region, there might be more VCs than our entrepreneurs opportunities for the time. But I think if you had to start, you much rather start with the money and attract the entrepreneurs. So I think that's a good way to sequence it. And I think what's even better here is that because there had traditionally, historically been a dearth of capital, it had forced entrepreneurs to be more scrappy to pull themselves up by the boot, bootstraps, to get to cash flow positivity and profitability early. That's a really good skill set to have in an environment where there's not drunken free money anymore. So I think that's a very positive thing in this, tech, in this world that we're currently in. Buddy, I, I saw you writing that down. Was that the book recommendation? <laughs> um, I won't tell you what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's pick up though. I know you were at Jitex last week, as was I. I'm sorry we didn't actually meet there. But I was looking at your sort of roundup on WAMDA with that, and I was surprised to see that global investment startups in Q3 was down by 15%. But in the Middle East and North Africa, it's down 67%. So why, if we're creating this fantastic ecosystem in this region, why is that? Uh, I think it is a product. One, one, you need to dig deeper into the statistics. Uh, part of the big number that has gone down is... Uh, because in the previous year, there were big acquisitions or big tickets. So if we remove that, it is not uh, lower much more than, it is less, it's like 20 to 25% rather than the 60% uh, element. I would also add that in Saudi Arabia, as my friend Omar would tell you, it's been a different trajectory altogether. So it came in later into the, into the ecosystem, but there are 43 funds, venture funds now in Saudi Arabia yeah. at various stages. So, yes, it slowed down a bit. Big funds globally did not stop investing in the region. Uh, uh, some of the big funds, Sequoia, even though Sequoia is writing checks again here in the region. Mm. But, uh, I mean, we're not dissociated from the rest of the world, just, just to say that. I mean, we are part of the rest of the world. If the rest of the world slows down, we see a slower down here. So it's, uh, Nadi, I'd like to drag you in here. I mean, your investment fund, your venture fund for agility is much more focused than most. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we're a corporate venture arm. So a lot of the businesses that we look at and invest in 
are somehow synergistically related to our portfolio and operating businesses, which is largely trade, aviation, and infrastructure. So our focus is largely on businesses that are there to disrupt what we have, drive productivity, and is core to driving and enhancing these operations. So from our perspective, our capital is relatively consistent and constant. It's much more longer term. And at the same time, we have more of a collaborative approach. When I say collaborative is we invest in strong management teams that are there to solve a problem and we support them by bringing them back into the business and testing their products and giving them the feedback because ultimately we want to scale that business in parallel to leveraging our emerging market platform and helping them roll out within these markets. I mean, I will pick up more on this region and investment, but before, before I do, um, Klaus, I know that this NATO investment fund that you now chair is very focused on defense and technology. And so before we move on, I'm curious about this as something of a diamond in the rough. This is an area that was quite controversial, I would say, even just a few years ago. Are you finding it easier to attract investment? So I think that uh, the war has changed a lot. <clears throat> in, in, the war in Ukraine. In, for Ukraine. And um, before that, people basically thought there is a deterrence forever and never uh, something military going on in a region. Mm. And with, with that having, been, having changed, there's a, a lot happening, meaning it is more um, socially accepted to start businesses, it is more socially accepted to finance them. And the, fi the NATO Innovation Fund was necessary because the normal VCs are not allowed to invest in dual-use companies because as an LP you do have churches or charities and then normally it is excluded from, <clears throat> from the use case. Mm. So, um, by the, so that's why last year in summer the NATO decided to set up the first multi-country sovereign wealth fund funded by the ministries of defense. But not of all of NATO, right? Not of all. 23 with Sweden joining 24. Um, and the purpose is to invest in technologies that enhance the defense capacity of NATO. Omar, let's move to regional diamonds. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to tell me that Saudi Arabia is the place for startups, for investment right now. It's lovely to see so many people here at FII. I imagine you're seeing more venture capitalists and startups here yeah. throughout the year at the moment. How is it transforming? Yeah, that's an interesting story. But uh, first, let me tell you that we actually we started uh, Raw Adventures back in 2015 as a CVC, as a corporate venture capital, and we pivoted later. So we'll wait for you to pivot with us later on. <laughs> uh, so uh, Saudi Arabia, the, uh, it wasn't the case in 2018, at least, uh, that Saudi Arabia is becoming the hub to the region. It used to be Dubai, Amman, and somehow Cairo. But I think because of the Vision 2030 initiatives has been kicked off in 2017 and the results has been um, like uh, we started to see the results in 2019. Things has been changing, has been is actually under changing for the, for, from the, since that time. So, uh, so now if you tell me that how much is your portfolio exposed to Saudi Arabia in 2018, it's <coughs> like 20%. Now it's more than 80% in 2023. It's almost... To 80% of my of right portfolios are in Saudi Arabia, so this change is, is drastic in in very in sh very short period of time, and that this uh, this is a result of two things: is that the Saudi founders and also the the residents in Saudi Arabia started to actually create their companies, uh, and also number two is that there is like a movement now from Egypt from many other countries around us to Saudi Arabia to relocate and to, uh, to establish their headquarters here. So this actually created, uh, is, create, is creating a momentum now in Saudi Arabia in terms of the amount of pipeline that we are seeing from Saudi Arabia that is far, far more than anywhere in the region. Hanadi, yeah. would you agree with that? I, I actually do, because I mean, I'll just give you two anecdotal examples. We incubated a freight platform here in Saudi Arabia several years ago, and it's cash flow positive and self-funded. So for a freight platform to be self-funded is, is, 
I mean, for those of you who know, it's been, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's one thing. And the other thing is we've invested in another e-commerce enablement business, which is growing quite rapidly. It's based in Saudi Arabia. And the even better story about it is that 60% of the employees in that business are women, and they enable one-third of the SMEs led by women into e-commerce and cross-border trade. So I definitely agree with the potential of Saudi Arabia. Fadi, I'm wondering whether you, as a Dubai man, will take umbrage with <laughs> Saudi Arabia now being the hub. Is it? So I've been in business for 42 years. Most of it, waiting for Saudi Arabia to open up. Mm. And when Saudi, op when Saudi opened up, there was exponential growth. So by definition, Saudi Arabia is practically 50% of the GDP of the region, maybe a little bit less. And so when Saudi opens up, when Saudi liberalizes, when Saudi changes its laws and regulations, when Saudi has a vision 2030, when Saudi is, is seeing what you see now, it drags the whole region with it. So, uh, uh, and I think it's healthy. I, I don't think we're in the business of competition. This is about uh, markets. This is about access to markets. This is about enabling entrepreneurs to scale their businesses. And whether you start in Dubai, in Amman, in Cairo, or wherever you can be, you need to always think. If you're thinking regionally, then, then you need to be in, in the largest market in the region. So it's purchasing power, engagement power, uh, adoption of uh, technologies power, uh, e-commerce uh, engagement power. I mean, it's, it's the powerhouse of the region. There is no argument here. Nobody's arguing with it. What I have an argument with is it's a misconception to think that it's competition. Mm -hmm. In reality, it is making the region better and go faster. So if Dubai thinks Dubai, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, or Riyadh is competition, go watch and see how Dubai is going to move much faster to keep up with that competition. <laughs> so for us, people that live in the region, engage in the region and build business in the region, amen. We love what Saudi Arabia is doing because it puts us all to become better. And then we turn to Europe, <laughs> Klaus. I mean, how can Europe compete at this stage in terms of an ecosystem for startups or a place for investment? With the Middle East, we have something of a liquidity crunch, a slowdown. Talk to us about Europe's position uh, as a tech hub. And of course, it's pretty disparate. We have lots of tech hubs. Yeah, look, <clears throat> the first thing is we need to start marketing ourselves <laughs> yeah, because we are not marketing ourselves. We are always very, very shy talking about the good things. Because when I tell you that we have, <clears throat> at some point, more than 300 unicorns in more than 120 cities, then um, barely anybody knows that. And also here, look, I mean, everybody from the US is here and very few people from Europe are here. So if you never talk about it, nobody will know it. Um, there has changed a lot in the ecosystem in the sense that the university have taken a very different stance. So before, when you compare it to the US, in the US, universities are private. So you need to market yourself in order to get the alumni money. And you market yourself by having great startups. In Europe, 1st of January, Kashin, yeah, one and a half billion from the state to the university. So the university was never looking and managing technology in the sense that they make a commercializable economy out of it. And that changed five years back when they, out of a vanity for science, employed um, American professors. And the American <laughs> professor said, I want to have equity in the startup of my institute. And at that moment, we had a huge drag from all the universities into commercializable science that hadn't happened before. So, so the, com the companies have changed completely. So it's not the 2000s when we had the copycat nation. Yeah. That was out of the sheer necessity that no technology people founded companies, so business people had to do that. Now, technology people found companies. So the universities are brilliant, but again, they can't market themselves. Yeah, the European politicians don't market the region. No, we're good yeah. at regulating, though. <laughs> yeah, look, the regulation, you have it sticks. everywhere. Yeah, you have everywhere regulation. <clears throat> but look, you need to, you know, there would be easy to, to talk about the good things. And, um, and I think there's one thing that could unleash a lot, which is more the fact that we are way more cautious in allocating money to the asset class. Mm. If you think about pension funds in the US, they allocate 15% of, 
of the assets into venture, according to the um, endowment model, in Europe, 0.02%. So basically, we do have like a shortage of money that, as Jack said, if you start with money, you will create a lot of follow-on. Um, and the, the lack of money basically is still holding the, the potential of the ecosystem significantly down. Let's bring Jack in there, because I think what you were describing there, the power of universities and funding, is pretty much describing Silicon Valley however many years ago. Well, quickly add, when you, when you want to ask that question, you can see that this is not a singular observation. So Sequoia set up an office, Andresen set up an office. So there is this tipping point in Europe right now, so and that has been recognized by the international VC funds so that they come over. And you do a lot of, with your different vehicles, a lot of investments into Europe as well. You have swapped, though, Silicon Valley, really, for Paradise Valley in Arizona. Does that spell the end of Silicon Valley? Do you think we are seeing a shift, particularly in the US, a more sort of democratized situation for tech and investment? So uh, the demise of Silicon Valley has been talked about a long time. And I we think, love to talk about the demise of Silicon uh, Valley. So California is a great place. Envy, envy. Um, it's a very onerous tax regime, at least for us Americans. So a lot of people have incentives to get out of California. Uh, and I think the pandemic, what happened during the pandemic, is so I think if you're a young person that's graduated from Stanford and you have a tech idea, you still have to do the pilgrimage up and down Sand Hill Road. That's never gonna change because you can't move Stanford. What you can change is that if you're a serial entrepreneur and you've already made money for one of the Sand Hill VCs and you're living in a shoebox in Menlo Park that costs $4 million for 2,000 square feet, you probably, you know, you look at your wife, you look at your family and say, listen, throw a dart at the map. We can literally move anywhere in the U.S. We can move to Riyadh. We can move to Dubai. Move anywhere in the world. And you can save an incredible amount of money. And so, because human capital is mobile. And so, I moved to Arizona uh, after we sold PayPal because, again, I wanted to get out of the owner's tax regime of California. And so, Arizona's been booming. Texas is booming. South Florida's been booming. And I think that's just going to continue because human capital is mobile. And the only reason why Silicon Valley in the early stages is staying there is because if you're a young graduate from Stanford again, you still have to do that pilgrimage up and down Sand Hill Road. Well, we only have ooh, just under seven minutes. So I'm going to give you each one opportunity. Which, what pressure has created what diamond for each of you in the last Let's few see. years? Omar. Yeah, so, uh, so the hard times uh, that uh, entrepreneurs are facing uh, are results of several forces, like uh, uh, regulatory forces, market adoption forces, uh, uh, funding forces, funding uh, challenges. So founders of technology startups are facing many, many challenges in their life. Uh, but I think maybe we can zoom in into one of the, um, the pattern of the, of the challenges in the last two years, especially in the region, which is... Fast growth uh, for the wrong reasons. So what do you mean? So when you, when you decide to scale a company, this company needs to have a product that people love. And this, is, this wasn't really the case uh, in 2021, unfortunately, because as Fadi mentioned, uh, people used to really raise massive amount of money with but also massive valuations without really having product market fit in the, um, uh, in, in the ground. So, uh, so that created like a massive gap between what the company can do and what the amount of money that they have, they have and the valuation they have. So I can blame hard times that came to so many founders that are facing now here uh, these days. It's actually from the boards and from the founders and from the VCs who are investing these companies. The pressure that they created to really cope up with the, with the valuation they decided uh, to, to put in this company was actually the wrong pressure. They need actually to have less amount of money. They need to have figured out the product market fit first of, the, of their product that they're building. And then after that, they need to start scaling and raising big amount of money so that they can scale this health unit economics they have. So, uh, so this has actually created an unpleasant uh, situation in 2023 for many of the portfolio companies. But we have also great uh, outcomes of that, uh, and we can, we, I can uh, tell you about uh, after my colleagues. Nadi, what diamonds have emerged for you? I think from our perspective, when we align sort of the ESG lens with our venture investing and thinking about our operating portfolio, which is largely based on trade and logistics, that created various opportunities in diamonds. What I mean is, when you think about logistics, it generates around 24% of the global emissions. Some of the investments we've seen and we've invested in, whether it's EV vehicles in Europe, whether EV vehicles in 
in the U.S. or infrastructure for charging stations, and looking at these companies and applying them within our own value chain, we see the alignment of profitability and sustainability come out at the same time. Buddy. Um, you know, building um, um, other, you know, being an investor is, is the later stage of my career. So I'm, as an entrepreneur, uh, and uh, as I was growing up building businesses, the, I can tell you that the harder the times, the more innovative we became, the better company we became, the more aligned we had. So the more money we had, the lazier we became, much lazier. So, and, and, and this is a message to all entrepreneurs. At the end of the day, businesses are built to become profitable, not to grow exponentially uh, at, at, at any cost. So uh, innovation happens in, in, in the worst of times, I think, because the pressure gets you to think how to solve problems uh, with the least amount of resources. And that's when you are going to be very creative. Opportunity in crisis, I love it. Klaus? You bet. Uh, look, <clears throat> it's pretty much the same what Hadi said. If you look at it at an abstract view, you can go to the years 2000 to 2004 or the financial crisis. Whenever there was a shortage of, of money and a depressed mood in the market, the best companies were built because of the fact that you had to be um, more scrappy and more you know, in innovative and use technique or technology for, for the progress sake. So I'm <clears throat> optimistic that yeah, in the counterintuitivity of, of the human nature, this is a, the right time to invest because currently a lot of entrepreneurs uh, are very, very thoughtful with their resources and with the energy they put in technology rather than solving problems with money. Jack, is this when then the environment that these two describe, is this when the next PayPal emerges? Uh, it is, um, and I'll come back to that in a second, but to finish on that Howard Marks comment that I made earlier, I think all investors have to reframe how they think about investments, every investment, because when your hurdle rate is zero versus 5%, or maybe it's going to six or seven, that's vastly different. So how is that good? So if you're trying to give money, it's a much better time. If you're trying to take money, much harder time. And so for us that are giving the money, what makes this environment so much better is that during that 13 years after the great financial crisis, there were so many fake entrepreneurs. Everyone wanted to become a millionaire kind of game being played. And so our job was that much harder because how did you figure out who was fake and who was real? Mm -hmm. Good news, at 5%, 6% interest rates, that herd has been culled. And so that is kind of the creating of the diamonds, if you will. Lovely. Final word. So as we talk about uh, hard times, I want to say that we also invest in Palestine. We invest in, in, in entrepreneurs and techies in Gaza, and our hearts and minds are with them. I need to say that. Important message to finish. Omar? So uh, today we are actually just to resonate to the uh, pressure creates diamonds. Today we are announcing uh, Noon Academy 41 million rounds, Series B. But the story, I'm ho I hope that Mohammed Dalan is here. The story of this company is actually horrific. So uh, the founders really created, it's an it, it tech, education technology. And uh, we can have like a, a zoom in later on, but they, had, they were about to die several times in their, in their, in their lives. So, uh, so that's a great achievement for them to reach this time. Thank you so much to all of these panelists. Thank I wish you. we had an hour. We could talk forever. Um, uh, thank you to you all.